turn in our Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. If I was to title the message tonight, it would be the birth of another church. Acts chapter 8. We'll begin reading in verse 4. The scripture says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now that would be any preacher's dream right there. That the people in one accord would give heed to what's being preached. Kind of reminded of one fellow asking, one preacher asking another preacher how many that he had in the service. And he said, well, we had about 100 in the service. And he said, uh, he asked him, uh, how many decisions you make? And he said, well, we had four decisions for Christ. And um, he asked the other man, he said, how many do you have in church? He said, well, we had about 150, and, uh, which was a good attendance for us. And then the guy asked him, and how many decisions? He said, we had 150 decisions. He said, some for and most against. <laughs> Here, with one accord... These people heard the preaching, and these, these weren't church members. These are lost people. They heard the preaching, and with one accord. That's just a powerful statement. That's not what I'm preaching on, but it just stands out right there. Notice what he says. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame and were healed. And there was a great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and, was, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, and wondered, beholding miracles and signs which were done. Now stop right there for a moment. Look at the beginning of that verse. It says, then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized. It doesn't say that Simon said he believed. It says in the narration, it says he believed also. Now that's a pretty clear statement, isn't it? He believed. Now, if we didn't read any farther, what would you obviously say? Saved or lost? Saved, Saved. yeah, no doubt. Simon himself believed also. Now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was, fa has, uh, was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I plead with you, Lord, that you'd fill me with the Spirit of God. I pray, Lord, that the scripture would be a challenge to us. 
that is, that as a church we would do our duty and spread the gospel to the regions beyond to continue to start local Bible-believing New Testament churches. Dear God, and to grow people in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Have your way in our lives that we all be a part of this, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you realize this or not, but Madison Baptist Church has had a major hand in starting an awful lot of churches. I don't have a clue what that number would be in total. Because you see, most all the missionaries that we support go to the mission field to start local churches. Now you take Brother Bob Cook, he started churches and, and, uh, and got churches going in a lot of different places. We mentioned up in Pennsylvania today, over in Tennessee, uh, worked in stuff, of course, over in Uganda, and then uh, also Jamaica. Uh, but our missionaries, seeing people saved, have put a lot of preacher boys out into the field to start churches. Uh, I don't know, maybe Brother Nelson has an idea how many churches have been started through Madison Baptist Church in the country of Uganda. But I guarantee it's a bunch. we got a lot of preachers starting churches over there right now still. That's been going on since Brother Stark first went over there. That's pretty exciting. We've had a part in that. Every missionary that we support, that's a church planning missionary, every one. Those that have gone out from Madison Baptist Church, Brother Ventura right now starting, uh, going on his second church. Uh, starting down there in Chile, out of our ministry, out of our Spanish ministry. And we could mention places all over, churches over in Spain, started through Madison Baptist Church, all of that. Right now, we're in the process of trying to start, uh, get three churches going here in the United States. We've, uh, we've got one that is going, a Spanish church down in Albertville, and uh, our Spanish congregation is taking care of that, Brother Abel, does most of the preaching down there for that. And uh, it looks like, you know, I'm hoping that within a year or so we'll be able to just let that church loose because it's doing, it's doing good. Now we've got a church we're trying to start down in Arab, Alabama and dealing with, uh, dealing with the Hispanics. Um, right now it's a little tough. We don't know how that's going to turn out. And then, of course, we support Brother Boyd, who's out of our church, trying to get a church started in North Myrtle Beach. As a matter of fact, I'll be preaching the one-year anniversary there in just a few weeks and uh, get to see what's going on over there in the building that they have. They've got land that they've been looking for and uh, trying to get something going. But that's what we're about, getting churches started, not, not just in the United States, but that's the hope. That's what we're commanded to do. You go out and win people and you get them into a local church and train them to do what we're doing here. That's what we want. That's what we're after. Our missionaries down in Brazil, all of that. And that's exciting to see God doing things like that. That's, that's New Testament Christianity working like it's supposed to work. That's funny. Everybody, uh, when I say everybody, most everybody thinks they know what a church is and what a church ought to be. They think they know what a church is because they've been to one or they've attended one. And yet the reality is most of the people don't have a clue what a church is supposed to be and what it's about. We do not believe in a social gospel. We, even, we believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ is to be preached to everybody. And when people get saved, get them into a Bible-believing local church where they can grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. That's what we do. So here we are, the first Sunday of April 2024, our basic position on all things with regards to the church, has got to come from the Scripture. Now, for instance, there's a reason why we only have men preaching in any of the services, or men teaching, unless, of course, it's a children's, uh, a children's class. Now, the reason for that is the Bible is very plain about who can preach and who can't preach in a local church. And so we just simply follow the Scripture. Now, our culture doesn't like that, but our culture is so far away from God, they're going to pervert just about anything that they touch. If we're going to follow God and do it like it's supposed to be done, you open up the Bible, find out what God says, and do it that way. We believe whatever it says about Jesus is exactly who he is. If people got a different idea of Jesus, they're worshiping another Jesus, not the Jesus who is the Savior. Same way with the Holy Spirit of God. We believe what it says about salvation is true, just like God says it. it. has nothing to do with what people think it ought to be because man's going to be wrong. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. 
We've got to make sure that we preach the pure gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Whatever it says about separation, it's just so. God wants his people. They're peculiar people. We are a peculiar people. He says, wherefore, come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Whatever God says about anything, when it comes to doctrine, we don't care what people think. We're concerned about what the Bible says. And we're going to follow the scripture. That's why we only baptize by immersion. It's the only thing that was done in scripture. The very word baptize means to immerse, to dip, or to put in two. When you start talking about sprinkling people, you're not talking about a Bible baptism. Uh, only an immerse, uh, immersion for uh, baptism is what God calls baptism. They went down into the water, came up out of the water. Neither one of those things are necessary if you sprinkle. And according to Romans 6, 3, and 4, it is a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And sprinkling doesn't picture that. Now, for those who do sprinkle, they say, well, we've already got the Lord's Supper. That pictures his death. Why do we need two ordinances dealing with his death? Well, he gave us two. We want as many as he gave us. He knows how many he wants for the local church. So we're just, we're going to do it his way, not going to do it our way. His way is the way we should do everything when it comes to how to live. Don't care what other people think. We know what the Bible says. We're going to follow the scripture. Now, we've already spent some time in the last few weeks. I've been dealing with different church things. And uh, we talked about the church at Jerusalem. We saw how they lost their position of dominance. And we went through the reasons where they lost their position of dominance to where after the 12th chapter, you basically find most of the main things going on take place out of Antioch, where they're sending out missionaries and, send, and, uh, and getting churches started, getting people saved throughout the Roman world. And they didn't have to have persecution to go out and to preach to the Gentiles. They went on purpose. The church at Jerusalem, they just stayed around Jerusalem and Judea. Jesus had commanded them that he said, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. So after the death of Stephen, there's a young man by the name of Saul of Tarsus who starts moving on with even more persecution of the church. Notice in verses 1 through 3, he says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And the devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Well, they hadn't gone out everywhere. Remember, Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And they've been sticking around Jerusalem and Judea. So God uses Saul of Tarsus to spread the gospel, and that, was, that wasn't his plan at that time. His plan simply was to do the church in as much as he could. But uh, he got them going out and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, Philip ends up going to Samaria. Now, Samaria is just north of Judah. And you remember on Wednesdays, we were talking about the death of the man of God. And his ministry was basically up in Samaria. Uh, he went to Bethel, where that false altar had been built by Jeroboam. You remember that? And uh, preached against that. We covered that whole thing up there just north of Judea. And here we find him going to Samaria. We find Philip, a deacon, going to Samaria. And there he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he has a tremendous impact. What's interesting about chapter 6 through chapter 8 is that you have two deacons now that are the center of attention. It's not the apostles at all. We find Stephen preaching in Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7. We find Philip preaching up in Samaria in Acts chapter 8. And we find a great work being done with a number of people getting saved. Now, you remember the Jews, they were not interested so much in the Samaritans. 
At one time, James and John even wanted to call fire down upon the Samaritans in Luke chapter 9. And Jesus said to them, you know not what spirit ye are of. He wanted them to realize he came to save men's souls, not to kill them. Now, he had to rebuke his disciples in that. They had to think about Samaritans. Samaritans were considered half-breeds because they were a mixed race. When the northern kingdom was taken over by Assyria, a number of the Jews were taken off into exile up to Assyria, and several Assyrians moved down into the area for, with the Jews that were remaining. And with their mixed marriages and so on, they were no longer uh, even the pure tribes hardly anymore. And so we find the, the faulty worship that took place because of Jeroboam that he brought on, and we covered that on Wednesday night. I want you to notice some things. First of all, it takes the preacher. Somebody had to take the message. And we've got Philip here. The apostles are staying down in Jerusalem. But Philip goes up to Samaria. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Somebody has to take the message to him. It doesn't take an ordained person to the gospel ministry to take the gospel to the lost. He's not one of the apostles. He's not called the pastor of church. He's up in that area. They need the Savior. He spread the gospel, and a whole bunch of them get born again. That's pretty exciting. So the preacher in this story is Philip. According to chapter 6 and verse 5, he was, was one of the first. Uh, to be set apart as a deacon to make sure that the Grecian Hebrew widows uh, got their fair share of the food that would be given to the widows. He was a soul winner who went, if you please, to the other side of the tracks, who went to the Samaritans, considered by the Jews to be less than dogs. Remember when Jesus told the story about the good Samaritan? The whole point was this, the pure Jews would pass by the man who'd been injured. And it was a Samaritan that stopped and took care of him. Who was his neighbor? He was making a point to the Jews about the lost. Philip evidently believed what Jesus said in Acts 1.5. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. That's Acts 1.8. Notice in verse 7 here. It says, For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. Now that's power. You don't see much of this anymore. And part of the reason you don't see much of this type of thing, there's two things. There's not an emphasis on the filling of the Holy Spirit for power in witnessing. And we need to get back to that. Jesus obviously emphasized that, told the disciples they were not even to go out and preach until they were endued with power from on high. That's part of the reason. The other reason is we've put alphabetic names on some of the problems that people have that are not physical problems at all. They're spiritual problems. If I believe that God's real, if I believe that Jesus is real, the Holy Spirit is real, and the Bible is real, I've got to believe that their demons are real as well. And they do influence men and women. We've got that in the scripture. We see up here in Samaria that was going on. Jesus has already gone up into heaven. And it's still a problem that had to be dealt with. And it is spirit-filled preaching that is the best way to deal with it. So that's what we see in this particular passage. You go down to verse 12. But when they believed Philip, Preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. What did they have to do? They heard the preaching. They had to believe the preaching. They had to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He preached to them Jesus Christ, and they got born again. Now, you look at the preacher here, and there's something to be said for him. It's not the apostles that get this Revival, it's not even really a revival, it's a vival, not a revival. They didn't have life yet until Philip went up there and preached. So we see a whole bunch of them get saved. But then we look at the people. 
Samaritans, half-breeds. Verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. It didn't make any difference if they were Samaritans or whatever they were. They needed the same Savior that everybody needs. Lost people, no matter what race they are, no matter what color they are, go to the same hell burning in the same fire if they don't get born again. Everybody, every creature needs Christ. They can only be saved by the same Savior that anybody gets saved by. The same way, by grace, through faith. Like all people, they were easily deceived. Look at verses 9 and 10. It says, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. Was he? No, he wasn't. What he did was of the occult. It was of the devil. But they couldn't tell the difference. And let me tell you something. The world out there can't tell the difference either. They hear about a miracle and they automatically accept that this must be of God. But I got news for you. Moses did some miracles because God empowered him. But then the devil empowered the magicians of Egypt to do the same miracles in those first few miracles that were done. I mean, and yes, it can be confusing, but you understand we do have a powerful foe who can do an awful lot of things. And the reality is people are so easily deceived. 1983, there were some people sitting in, a, uh, in some chairs at a hospital down in Walker County, Alabama. They went to, I, I think it was the Walker County Hospital. I'm not sure the exact name of the place. It is still there. And somebody got to looking at a door. And as they looked at the door going into one of the rooms, they saw that the grain was shaped in a way that it looked like a human face. Now, what I can't understand is when anybody sees anything that is out of the ordinary, that looks like the face of a man, it has to be Jesus. I mean, what photograph do they compare it with of the Lord Jesus Christ to know that that face, whatever it is, that they can see out of that door, that it has to be Jesus? And so it got, they got to talking about it. People said, yes, I can see the face too. By the way, there are pictures of it on the Internet. You can get on the Internet, and you can look at the pictures, and sure enough, it looks like the face of a man. It must be Jesus. Why? It's a door. In the next two weeks after that, 10,000 people went to that hospital. They had to take the door off the hinges and put it in a different part of the hospital behind some plexiglass where when people come to see it, they can get out of the way. And in 2024, that door is still there and people still come by easily deceived. People still are easily deceived. You would think that with all the technology, all the education, all the learning that we have, that people would somehow be a little bit smarter, but they're not. I mean, after all, virtual reality is the big thing. It's lie to me, lie to me, lie to my senses. Get me something that's not real. I don't want to live in the real world. I want something's made up, and they're so easy to grab it. The truth is, mankind has been easily deceived for a long time. Early in the 1800s, there was a man who said that an angel appeared to him, And that if he would dig in a particular hill in the state of New York, that he would find some hieroglyphics on golden plates. And that with a special seer stone, he would be able to translate what was on those plates. His name was Joseph Smith. And out of that beginning began the Mormons. 
what is known today as the Church of Latter-day Saints. Now, it began with that fairy tale. He had eight witnesses that were around him, the eight, who he would put a covering over his head, and supposedly with his seer stone, he would read the hieroglyphics and somebody would be writing as he would translate the hieroglyphics that were on those stones. Now, people who have studied this and gone through it know that really what it comes down to is a book written by a man by the name of Solomon Spaulding in 1811 that was plagiarized by Joseph Smith. Now, that book is called the Book of Mormons. By the way, they have four books in Mormonism. They have the King James Bible. They have the Book of Mormons. They have Doctrine and Covenants. And they have the Pearl of Great Price. They have four books. And people are still easily deceived by that man, Joseph Smith, who did that stuff back in in 1821. 20 and 21. Uh, Then there was a TV preacher. Not all that long ago. He's dead now. But he was in a hospital room and supposedly a 700 foot Jesus appeared in his room. I'm trying to figure out how he fit in that room. But there was a 700 foot Jesus that told him if all of his all of his ministry partners would pony up $42.50 each that that 700-foot Jesus would give this man a cure for cancer. Millions were raked in because people are so easily deceived. Still today, well, we're talking about Americans. We're supposed to be smarter than that. You go back into the 1800s, there was a man by the name of Miller who had made several predictions about the second coming of Christ. He had missed every one. But what really got the Millerites going was a lady that was a follower who had epileptic seizures. You understand back in the 1800s, it was not uncommon to take somebody with epileptic seizures and put them into a sanitarium where they would have numbers of different tests that would be run on them. To cover that up, she said she was having visions that God was showing her things. One of the things God showed her was a tablet of the Ten Commandments with the fourth surrounded and glowing in gold, something that must be kept. Now, today, they're known as the Seventh-day Adventists. And that's why when you get a book dropped in your driveway... That looks pretty nice. The coloring's nice. The book like it's got some interesting title, usually dealing with the second coming of Christ, uh, something like that that will be on that. You look inside, you can't find anything that says Seventh-day Adventist. What you do, you have to go usually to the back of it. I just got one the other day in the mail. And on the inside, big letters, Ellen G. White. Whenever you see Ellen G. White, even though you won't find the name Seventh-day Adventist, anywhere in the book, Ellen G. White tells you that's a Seventh-day Adventist book. And people still fall for that stuff. There was a man who said that he and his wife represented the second coming of Christ. He said Jesus in his first coming failed. In his first coming, Jesus came to set up the perfect home. And he failed. And so Sun Young Moon said that he was the second coming of Christ. He and his wife to set up the perfect union between man and a woman. Thousands of people followed them. And not just in Korea, in the United States. They would have mass weddings. In matter of fact, in Houston, they had a mass wedding of 50 thousand people to get married to one another many of them just simply picked out by those of his followers it's called the unification church and by the way he sent that they sent out videos to preachers all over the country about their teachings in genesis that the fall of man was not eating of a forbidden fruit adam and eve committed adultery How? 
Now, wait a second. You say, I don't think you ought to run people. I'm just telling you what happened. People still fall for it. Now, he's dead now. I, I, I never really got anything about whether or not he thinks he finally fulfilled the reason Jesus came the first time, but he missed it. These people were just as easily led astray. They felt that this Simon, with his occultic practices, was the great power of God. Hey, people are all caught up in that today. And we're not just talking about people gladly claiming to be witches and practicing the dark arts of witchcraft. And some will say they're white witches. Some will say they're black witches. Supposedly the white witches are the good witches. According to the scripture, no witch is a good witch. Has nothing to do with what color of witchcraft that they may participate in. It is wicked and it is wrong. But you understand that there are a lot of people making millions of dollars off of so-called paranormal, paranormal, did I say it right? Paranormal shows. I'm making millions. They've got people believing in so much garbage. And they'll go into a building. They'll go into a building and they'll talk. And sometimes when they supposedly talk to the spirits are there that are there, they think they're there, they'll hear a noise. You know, I got up the other night, and I went into the, I went into the living room. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I laid down on the couch for a little bit, and I just kind of lay there. I heard noises in my house. My house makes a lot of noises. Do you suppose it's haunted? <laughs> no, it's just the house. Houses make noises. Buildings make noises. Those aren't demons cracking about, walking in there, stubbing their toe. That's not what's going on. They'll tell, you, they'll tell you things like this, that these people, they haven't crossed over yet because they had some great, terrible thing that happened. Nonsense! From the Word of God, I know that when you die, you either go to heaven or hell. You don't stick around. God has all the answers for that stuff. Don't believe that nonsense. And by the way, they still haven't found Bigfoot. <laughs> Although, I did read about a basketball player. He's not in high school anymore, by the way. He's 23, 24 years old, 7'11", 7 feet, 11 inches tall. 7 feet, 11 inches tall. He wears a size... 52 shoe. He could not find, they had to specially make shoes for him because the highest they went up to was 50. 52, that's a big foot. I mean, that's the real thing right there. I'm just simply saying, that people are so easily led astray. Now, when you think of all the different things that the Samaritans had heard, and they believed a lot of wrong things, thank you, Jeroboam, uh, for how they, they changed the scriptures and they taught other things, they did believe that a Messiah was coming, but they believed falsely about so many things, and isn't it amazing that when the preaching was given, what on earth did he preach? It says, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. What did they need? They needed the pure gospel. That's what they needed. We think somehow, I, I remember when I went to college, uh, there was a class on Christian apologetics. Well, I had never heard the term before. I thought, I'm not apologizing for anything, but that's not what apologetics are. Apologetics are defenses of the gospel where when some skeptic comes along and says, well, what about this, what about that, supposedly teaches you how to answer them. And they're all kind of arguments for God. God doesn't argue his existence. He just says, in the beginning, God. That's what God thinks of it. He's given us the heavens, and the heavens declare the glory of God and the power of God. And according to Romans chapter 1, that's God's evidence of who he is. That's enough for the child of God. Well, here's Philip. He goes up to these people that believe different than what he believes. 
We don't find him racking his brain to try to figure out how can he talk to them so that they'll listen to him. He just gives them the gospel. And in one accord, they gave heed to the things that he had to say. We need to stop trying to get cute and figure out how we can think around these people and go to them in the power of the Holy Spirit of God and give them the simple truth of the gospel. Now that's what gets people born again. This is powerful. That makes us uh, look then at the preaching. Verse 4, it says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Now, when you think about that, they didn't have a New Testament. You know, we go up to a door and we've got our New Testament in our coat pocket or in our back pocket. And man, we can whip that thing out there, the sword of God, and we can give them verse after verse from our New Testament. Philip didn't have a New Testament with him. He had a New Testament message. But the proof of the New Testament truths are all found in the Old Testament. You know, Isaiah 53, matter of fact, Isaiah 53, the whole chapter is pretty good to give the gospel. There are a lot of verses. Remember when Jesus was walking on the road to Emmaus, he came up on those two disciples and they were downcast and Jesus said to them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Man, what a Bible lesson that must have been. Went through the Old Testament proving all that happened to Jesus was prophesied in God's word. You don't have to be ashamed of sharing the truth, Old Testament or New Testament. But the people need the straight message of Christ and who he is. The Bible says being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. Powerful, powerful preaching. So we preach Christ. And as I said, note in verse 12, the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, he preached that. When Paul gives a testimony, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of of God. The preaching of the cross still works. Now sometimes we think, you know, they're just, man, some of those preachers are so smart and they can make it clear to these people that are highfalutin and deep thinkers and that's what they need. No, they need the gospel. They need the gospel. The gospel still works. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It still works. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And notice beginning at verse 1. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's straight preaching. Philip went up there, a deacon. We don't know what kind of oratory he had, but we do know this. He just preached unto them the kingdom of God and of Christ. And they believed and they were saved. That's the people. What's the product of that? 
Well, we go back here to Acts chapter 8. We look at verse 6. It says, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. The people got saved. Something was going on there. Now, wait a second. They had seen miracles. They had seen Simon do miracles. But they're forsaking, God, uh, they're forsaking the devil's miracles. And they're grasping the one who has empowered Philip. And they are believing in the Christ that Philip preached. He didn't preach himself. And look at the verse 8. It says, and there was great joy in that city. Great joy. Wouldn't it be great to see God save a thousand souls in Madison, Alabama, and great joy coming to Madison? Amen. Now, we don't do it for joy, but that's what takes place here. It's the product of it. You got people getting saved, they get happy about some things. I mean, who isn't happy about going to heaven? Matter of fact, to me, that's the best thing. I'm going to get to be with Jesus for eternity. Hallelujah. I don't have to worry about hell. I don't have to worry about burning. Thank God my sins are forgiven. I'm clean in his sight. And that's joyful right there. Of course, we spend so much time watching the, uh, the different news feeds and the different talk radio people, talk television people who are arguing and fighting all the time. It'd be good just to stand around and share the joy that we have in Jesus Christ. Maybe we'd smile more. Because I have found, I don't care how much you listen to Fox News. Now, Rush Limbaugh's not on the air anymore, and I appreciate where Rush Limbaugh stood on a number of things. But you know what? You get done with that, or Mark Levine, or, or any of these others, you're ready to fight. There's not any joy there. And hearing it doesn't change the situation at all. But I tell you what, rejoicing in what you have in the Lord changed you. And at least living, yes, maybe a lot of miserable things. Well, there are a lot of miserable things in this country, a lot of horrible things in this country. But I tell you what, when the Lord in your heart is the most important, the most important thing you have to dwell on in your life, you can be joyful in the midst of terrible situations. Great joy. This is Samaria. This isn't Jerusalem. This is Samaria. It's the capital city. It's the center of that wickedness. And the Bible says of Simon himself believed. Now, what about Simon? There, there is some church tradition. I don't know that I'd trust Catholic church tradition. That he ended up leaving and went back into the occult. I don't believe that. Now, Peter really rakes him over the coal. I mean, he gives him a hard time. Let's go back to this passage here in chapter 8 and see what Peter... Now, here's what happens. Peter and John have gone there, and they're laying hands on these new believers, and they're being filled with the Holy Spirit. And praise the Lord for that. And Simon sees that. Now, he's just believed himself. Simon, all of his life, or at least in the main part of his adult life, he's been an occultist, and all he's known is power comes by money. That's what he's known. That's been his life. He asked the question, how much can I give you for me to be able to do this same thing? He wanted to do what they were doing. Now, I got news for you. When I got saved, I didn't suddenly become a Bible scholar. There's a lot of things I didn't know that I had to learn. I can remember I pronounced leaven, leaven. I couldn't figure, I didn't know what it was. I was totally ignorant about that. There are a lot of things I was totally ignorant about. But sometimes we expect, like, here's a new convert. Uh, they come to church and they say, yeah, Brother Jeff saved me. Now, we're hyper-spiritual here, so... We say, no, no, Brother Jeff didn't save you. God saved you. You need to get that right. We want to rebuke the person. And yet Paul says, 
I am become all things to all men that by all means I might save some. And what Paul said, he said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. When a new convert says something that may not be exactly theological right, you don't have to jump down their throat. They'll learn it. They'll learn it. They'll get it. It'll come. But on the first day, there are some other things that ought to be covered first. You ought to be rejoicing in their salvation. Somebody's dealt with them. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. So when he, he asked about giving money for this, well, Peter gets on him pretty good. Notice it says in verse 20, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Boy, now this is where most people would say, I'm not going back to that church. I thought they cared for me. How do I know that this guy really got saved? I'm going to tell you how I know. Look how he responded. He just gets rebuked really hard. And his response to being rebuked by Peter then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. I guarantee you he never asked how much again. Peter straightened them out. And when they're real, they take it. You can, re- you know, you can rebuke a young Christian a whole lot easier than you can rebuke an older one. Older ones get all offensive. As a matter of fact, you'll find as you knock on doors, there are some people who are church members and have been church members for years. You ask them, do you know if you die tonight, you go to heaven? Now they're mad. You've insulted them. You're questioning their salvation when they should be thrilled to death that you cared for their soul. But you take some new believer, they say, glory to God, yes, I just got saved. But don't expect these new converts to understand everything. They've got to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. I thank God for the patience that my pastor had on me. He had a lot. I remember the last movie we went to. I hadn't been saved a while, but, uh, and you know, I hadn't been involved in church all that long. I'd, I'd just been saved for a few weeks, and we went to a movie called The Poseidon Adventure. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen it or not. Don't waste your time. Definitely don't waste your money. Um, but I can still remember the pastor came in to the radio station. He had a broadcast, a five-minute broadcast at 725 every morning. And I said, well, Pastor, my wife and I, we went to, uh, we went to the Poseidon Adventure last night. And I said, uh, I said, you know, they didn't do much cussing in it. I mean, I was just being honest with him. Why? I was a new believer. Now, if he would have raked me over the coals, I, I would have deserved it. I, mean, I wasn't being rebellious, but he didn't. He just smiled at me and said, okay. That was it. We did fine. We grew. And it wasn't long. We stopped going to those things. It wasn't long. I can remember we had, I preached, uh, we had a family that I led to Christ. Actually, I led her to the Lord. This was when I pastored in Manchester, Tennessee. And Alice was her name. Do you remember her husband's name? The, the reason, uh, I was pastoring in Manchester and when I knocked on their mobile home door, uh, they were from Paw Paw, Michigan. They eventually moved back to Paw Paw, Michigan. Well, there at their, at their kitchen table, I led her to Christ, and he rededicated his life to the Lord. And they came out to the church that Sunday. And I can still remember, I preached a really hard message. I mean, harder than anything you've heard me preach in the last six months. And we've had a couple of pretty hard messages, but I mean, I hid everything. It was Sunday morning. It was their first service to be into. 
And I thought, man, I wonder how Alice is taking this. She's a brand new Christian. I wonder how she's taking this. When the service ended, I went back and stood at the back doors to shake hands with people as they went out. And Alice came up to me with her husband right behind her. And she took my hand to shake it. And she said, boy, I got a lot to learn. So, Isn't that sweet? Yeah, but that's a new Christian, you see. They're excited they're saved. This is all new to them. And they want to know. A new Christian does, they have a desire to know. And it may sting. Listen, when I got saved, I thought the pastor was calling my wife every Sunday. It seemed like I thought she's telling him what she thinks I need. He didn't. He was just preaching the book. And if he's preaching the book, he's going to hit everybody. Guess what? That's the way it works. Nobody has to tell them. The Holy Spirit. I believe every service, God's got something for everybody. Amen. And I, I'll hit people. I have absolutely no clue who's being hit that morning. I can still remember we had a gentleman by the name, Jim Stout. Now, I think he may be in glory now. I'm not positive. But me and a deacon there at First Baptist in Otsego, Michigan, uh, we, were out, we were out visiting. We knocked on his door. And uh, he invited us in, real pleasant fella, and we went through the gospel with him. He he didn't get saved. As a matter of fact, you know, he was pleasant, but by the things that he said, I can still remember walking outside, was getting in the car, looking over the car at the deacon that I was with, and I said this, this was on a Thursday night, I said, he'll never get saved. That was on Thursday night. Saturday night, he got saved. Now, on Thursday night, I didn't think he'd ever get saved. Saturday night, he got saved. And that next day, he was in church. You don't know who God's dealing with and what he's doing. We're just to be faithful and give it. You know, some, some water, some plant, and some reap. And the idea that nobody can get saved through a quick presentation of the gospel is nonsense. You don't know how many times they've heard the gospel before you got there. You might be the first one to give it to them, but you might be the tenth one to give it to them, and they're ready. I still remember knocking on the door of Brother Reed. He wasn't a brother then. He was lost. He was a truck driver. And uh, I'd witnessed to him a couple times. In a, in a, they lived in a mobile home up around uh, South Pittsburgh, Tennessee. And we had gone back to Michigan for me to be ordained at First Baptist in Otsego, And uh, when we came back, I went out to his place over there by South Pittsburgh. And when I knocked on the door, he came to the door and he started boo-hooing. I mean, I talked to him a few times. It just never seemed to sink in. And he started crying right away. He said, oh, preacher, he said, I'm so glad that you've come by. He said, while you were gone, my wife went to the doctor and the doctor said she's got cancer. I need to talk to you, preacher. And I said, okay. We went in. I went through the gospel again. I spent about 45 minutes going through it again. And it just didn't seem to be clicking. And I I, I said to him, uh, you know, why won't you take Christ as Savior? And he was stuck on this. He said, I'm I'm just an ignorant trucker. Sorry, Ralph. But, I mean, that was his comment. (laughs) I'm just an ignorant trucker. I can't even read. I can't understand this stuff. And I said, I almost said Ralph. (laughs) I shouldn't have done that. Uh, (laughs) I I said, Mr. Reed, do you want to go to heaven when you die? And boy, that did it. Man, the floodgates just opened up. And he said, nobody wants to go to heaven worse than I want to go to heaven. I said, all right, then just take Christ as your Savior right now. And man, he hit that coffee table and he just started crying out to God for God to save him. He didn't need to be led in a prayer. He wanted to go to heaven. And he saw Christ as his only hope. Hey, the gospel still works. He said, well, I'm not that smart. You don't have to be that smart. Be smart enough to just trust God's message to be sufficient. And God can use you in a great way. So Philip went, preached to the people who needed it. Souls were saved. Lives were changed. 
The main difference between the churches that see people saved and those that don't is that they simply go. They go to the lost. They go to the lost. I'm convinced most people don't get saved at church. I didn't get saved at church. I got saved in the living room of our home. I'm sorry, at the radio station, WAOP in Otsego. I was looking at my wife. She got saved in the living room of our home. Most people don't get saved in the church house. Matter of fact, we had one man in our church up in, uh, up in Manchester. He got saved in the bathroom. He was sitting there reading a track. Saw his need for Christ. He got saved there. The gospel's powerful. But somebody's got to take it. And that leads us to the perpetuation. The news was out. Those people got saved. Word got back to the apostles. And so they sent some people there to help them to grow. You see, we need to understand how it was, for instance, on the day of Pentecost. And they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there was added unto them 3,000 souls and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and of prayers. They stuck with it. They learned. They grew. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So we see the preacher, just a layman. But what a great, what a great meeting as in one accord they attended to what he spoke. The people, they needed a savior. They heard the gospel that saves. They accepted the salvation in Christ. And it continued on. A great work was done in a place that a lot of Jews thought no great work could ever be done. Samaria, of all places. We've got a great gospel. Do you realize there are Muslims getting saved all over the world? Today, because people are taking the gospel to them. Now, you may not see many, but it's amazing how God can take that number and multiply it. Don't be afraid of them. I don't believe you have to know all about Islam to win Muslims to Christ. The gospel still works. We just have to be faithful and give it. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is an exciting story. This is exciting that these people up in Samaria, of all places, would have such a fantastic meeting where so many would get born again out of their Bible ignorance, out of their Bible heresy, simply at straight preaching that came from a deacon who told them about your son. God, challenge our hearts today. I thank you for what you've allowed us to do as a church. But the reality is we could do so much more if we just realize it doesn't depend on us. Your power, your message, your word, our part is simply to take it. And it's the Holy Spirit of God who does the convicting. Have your way in our lives tonight, we pray in Jesus' name.